Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Rethink Digital Literacy with the Rotaract Club of Kingston. Um, we are so happy to have you here, and we think this would be a great session for everyone involved. So for some context before we go ahead, uh, we wanted to go ahead and host the session because we felt that more awareness could be shared on the topics of cyber safety and digital literacy. And given the rise in the use of the internet and more importantly, social media, we thought that this would be a great time for a session like this. Now, for some housekeeping, uh, if you wish to have this session translated, there is an interpreter button. You can just hit more and you'll see interpretation there. And for any questions you may have during the session, they can be posted in the Q&A section also under the more button. And we'll get to them at the end of the session. So now let me introduce our very special guest speaker, Trisha Prabhu. She is the founder and CEO of Rethink, a patented app that proactively stops cyberbullying, Rethink, oh, cyberbullying, sorry. Rethink, which Trisha invented when she was just 13, has been named one of Google Play's most innovative apps and shared with youth in, and is shared in the youth with, in 136 nations. For her efforts, Trisha and Rethink have been featured on the TED stage at the White House and on Forbes 30 Under 30. Now, Rethink is also a winner of the Elevate Prize and Harvard's President's Innovation Challenge, and she has decided to partner with District 7030 to promote online safety and combat cyberbullying through her Rethink efforts. So that's just a little bit of context as to why we wanted to host a session like this. And we hope everybody here would have a great time and learn something new. Uh, Trisha, I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carol. And hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for for making the time to join me this evening and uh, take some time uh, out of your out of your days to to touch on what I think is a very important topic and what I hope you all will think is a very important topic at the end of the talk. Um, as Karel said, my name is Trisha Prabhu, and I'm the founder and CEO of Rethink, a global movement with the mission of tackling cyberbullying and redefining internet culture to be more positive. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen um, so you all can see my slides. Can I just get a thumbs up um, if folks can see my slides, just so I know that people are able to see? If anyone give it, perfect. I got a thumbs up. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, then let's go ahead and, and get into it. So for our agenda today, um, I'm hoping to spend the next about 40 minutes, 35 to 40 minutes, um, talking a, a little bit about four key themes. One, I want to introduce to all of you the issue of cyberbullying and online hate, um, talk through some statistics, um, go ahead and wrap our, our heads around this problem, um, and get a little bit more of a detailed granular look at, at how it affects youth and in what different ways it affects youth. Um, then we'll get into, um, you know, why it is that I'm speaking to all of you tonight, what first inspired me to get into the anti-hate um, activism space, uh, my journey to do this work, and, um, you know, uh, why, why it is that I'm so passionate about this work. Um, and then, you know, really want to spend a good chunk of time on these last two sections, um, talking about how youth can take on and tackle online hate, um, advice and tips for parents, you know, educators to share with youth on how they can do that, and then some general digital literacy tips on how young people can live healthier lives um, and ensure that the relationships that they're cultivating in digital spaces are safe, um, you know, kind, inclusive, um, and, you know, ultimately, um, you know, the, the best for them. And I'm going to try and leave 15 to 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. I might be closer to 10 to 15 if I know myself. I can uh, I can go over a little bit, but hopefully a good chunk of time at the end for Q&A, and then, and then we'll wrap up. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, let's start by talking a little bit about cyberbullying. So, you know, one question you might want to start with, and I think it's helpful to kind of ground ourselves in this, you know, you might ask, well, what is cyberbullying? Um, I like to think of cyberbullying, um, you know, by, by thinking about this de definition, cyberbullying is bullying that takes place over digital devices like cell phones, computers, or tablets. Now, when you see this definition, you might think, well, uh, you know, it, are you just telling me then that cyberbullying is just the digital manifestation of bullying? It's not really different substantively in any way. Um, I would say no. 
In fact, you know, this definition, while helpful, it helps us kind of get our hands around, okay, what is cyberbullying tangibly? It's bullying that's happening in the digital world. But I think this definition kind of misses two key dis distinctions that really differentiate cyberbullying from traditional bullying. One is that cyberbullying, unlike traditional bullying, is often 24 seven. When you think about traditional bullying, you know, maybe it happens at a school, right? And, you know, a, a child is being bullied at school and then they can go home, right? And the bullying stops. But with cyberbullying, it is 24 seven, it is constant. When a young person come, goes home, their device comes with them. And that means that the cyberbullying and the online hate follows them, right? So that's one key way that cyberbullying is distinct from bullying. The other key way that cyberbullying is distinct from bullying is often it's perpetrated by anonymous actors. With bullying, it's really easy, right, to identify who the perpetrator is. You can see them, right? They're bullying you. Maybe it's in the school playground. With cyberbullying, often a lot of the hate and the vitriol that victims experience can come from people with anonymous usernames, right? They're not even sure who's targeting them. And that, of course, can make it really difficult to identify the attacker, to try and tackle the problem, to report it, and to get it to stop. And so those are two key ways that I like to think about cyberbullying as different and two key ways that contribute to cyberbullying often being worse than just traditional in-person bullying. So that's cyberbullying. Who is it affecting and at what rates is it affecting youth? Well, according to um, the most recent research, 46% of youth aged 13 to 17 have been cyberbullied. That is, they've experienced one of kind of five key forms of cyberbullying, according to these surveyors. Um, that's nearly 50%, right? So clearly this issue is, as I often like to say, a silent pandemic, right? It's a problem affecting so many youth um, globally. And the other thing that we've noticed is, you know, this is kind of one monolithic number. But when we look at specific populations and communities, women, people of color, um, historically marginalized groups like the LGBTQ plus community, um, they experience cyberbullying and online harassment at disproportionate rates. So LGBTQ youth, um, at least in the US, are three times as likely to be targeted relative to other youth. And according to most research, that's pretty consistent um, around the world where it's two to three times as likely um, LGBTQ youth are to be targeted online relative to other youth. And so it goes to show, right, that this number tells us one story. But this other number tells us that, you know, there are certain communities and populations that are affected even more, right? Um, and in ways that often target who they are, their identity. That's something that's interesting that, you know, I, I think both students and, and teachers and parents are sometimes, uh, you know, equally, equally taken aback by or surprised by, um, is the research shows that um, teen women are actually both the most common targets of cyberbullying and the most common perpetrators. Um, there's a lot of interesting research as to why that might be. Um, it might be, you know, some researchers speculate because, um, you know, cyberbullying is kind of, it's a little bit less of a direct form of aggression, um, something that, that you know, women, when, you know, maybe they get into fights, they want to rely on. Um, but but that's just something to something to keep in mind. Now, of course, this does not mean that, you know, young men are not, you know, you know, cyberbullying one another or are not the victims of cyberbullying. Certainly, there are a lot of young men um, who have um, who have been cyberbullied. Um, so but just to say that this is just um, kind of an interesting fact um, that I think is important to keep in mind, because it is it is the specific community of teen women and in particular 15 to 16 year old women who are the most likely to be um, to be affected. So where is this cyberbullying happening? Um, interestingly, the research shows that Instagram is where most youth, most youth report being harassed. Now that's likely in part because a lot of youth also spend a lot of time on Instagram, um, but it's also because, um, you know, unfortunately, um, Instagram, while while being a place, you know, where where young people can connect and and build relationships, it's also a place where um, there there can be there can be hate and harassment. And, you know, most recently, uh, you know, one of the one of the stunning revelations that we had um, coming out of some of the whistleblowers um, that have kind of, you know, blown the whistle on Meta in the last year or two is that according to Instagram's own internal research, youth on the platform are 100 times more likely to witness or experience cyberbullying content in one week than Instagram publicly claims youth experience in a year. Right. So what we see, you know, platforms necessarily saying about how safe or unsafe their platforms are is unfortunately not consistent with what young people are experiencing. And young people are especially reporting that Instagram is where they're being harassed. 
So what do we ultimately lose in all of this when, you know, young people experience cyberbullying? You know, what's compromised? Um, you know, at, at a high level, it's it's mental health, right? Victims of cyberbullying, you know, consistently report feelings of worthlessness, anxiety, not wanting to go to school. In more extreme cases, depression, right? Other mental health issues. Um, so, you know, what we're ultimately doing is contributing to a mental health pandemic that is already affecting youth uh, because of, you know, a number of other challenges, right? Um, and so those challenges are now interacting with this other big challenge, right, which is social media harms. And it's exacerbating this mental health crisis that today's youth find themselves in. Now, this is kind of the last statistic that I like to, I like to end on. Um, we're going to be coming back to it. But this, I think, is arguably the most important statistic that I'll show you today. And that is that research finds that 90% of cyberbullying victims do not report an incident of abuse to an adult or teacher. They choose to suffer in silence. And so one thing that you know, I'm, I'm going to be hoping to do through this presentation today, and one thing that you'll see really motivates my work in this space, is thinking about how we can change this number. And thinking, too, about how we can ensure that we're not putting the burden on youth to have to report cyberbullying, because what the research finds consistently is that is just not an effective solution. So th that is something that we're going to be coming back to. But I think this statistic is really stunning, right? Young people are not turning to teachers and parents when they're experiencing cyberbullying. So the first question is, how do we change that? The second question is, how do we keep young people from being in that situation in the first place? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so now we kind of have a general sense of what cyberbullying is, right? How it relates to in-person bullying. We've got a sense of the statistics, right? Who it's affecting, how it's affecting them. I think it's now helpful to go ahead and kind of unpack this this kind of you know broad term that I'm using, cyberbullying, right? That that's a very broad term that refers to different types of online hate that manifest. And in particular, you know, tonight I want to call your attention to kind of three key types of online hate that are especially relevant. Um, to youth today that we've seen in the literature that I've seen and talking to youth today um, are becoming especially prevalent. The first is group harassment. Um, so this is when, you know, young people are targeted in a group chat or in some sort of group setting. You can think of it as kind of the mob mentality of a group of people, you know, bullying someone in person translated to the digital environment, Right. Um, and in that group setting, it can be harder often for youth who are watching the cyberbullying happen, happening to be, you know, to be an upstander, to say something. Um, but group harassment is increasingly, um, you know, an important issue in the U.S. 42 percent of youth report um, either having been harassed or having witnessed seeing someone else be harassed in a group group chat type of setting. Another key type of online hate that's extremely relevant um, is harassment of women. So we already talked about, you know, referenced, I referenced earlier, you know, cyberbullying affects different communities but disproportionately. Women is increasingly, um, women are increasingly, you know, kind of one of those key communities um, that, that are being harassed. Um, and in particular, you know, they're often targeted with, um, you know, vulgar comments. Um, this is especially true um, in the gaming space. Um, you know, which is not necessarily, you know, the most friendly to women, um, but it's also becoming a, a broader reality for women, particularly with the introduction of new technologies like AI, right? AI is increasingly being used um, and weaponized against women, um, you know, often, again, you know, sexualizing them in some way, targeting them with, vul you know, vulgar comments. Um, and so, you know, women are really a, a very key stakeholder group when we think about the type of online hate um, that's manifesting today and who it's affecting, um, because a lot of this online hate is specifically geared, um, unfortunately, at tearing women down. So that's something that, that we really have to keep in mind. And then image and video-based harassment is absolutely on the rise. And this is one of the clearest trends that we've seen in the last five years. If you think about the most popular social media platforms that we've seen take off in the last five years, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, um, you know, uh, you know, these are all, they all have one thing in common, and that is they are image and video based platforms, right? <laughs> you're not just, you're not just, you know, using text anymore, right, to communicate a message, you're using an image, you're using a video to communicate that message. Um, and so um, that means that things like offensive memes have started to become relevant, right? Um, you know, including, so too has online sexual harassment. Right. Um, images and videos that sexually harass victims. 
Um, so image and video-based harassment is increasingly a growing issue. And sadly, we've seen a lot of extreme cases, um, you know, globally of young people being harassed with images and videos, um, sometimes to really extreme ends with extreme consequences, um, you know, sometimes permanent consequences. So this is something to really keep in mind because, you know, a lot of platforms are not equipped to take on image and video-based harassment. This is a, a really difficult issue to tackle, but this is one of the key types and one of the most prevalent types of online hate that we are seeing today. Okay. So, you know, I've talked quite a bit about cyberbullying. Hopefully I've provided, you know, some orientation to the topic, to the issue, to, you know, various digital harms that, you know, different youth are facing today. Um, and I want to take a step back and kind of, you know, introduce myself in a little bit more detail, so to speak. Talk a little bit about who I am and, and what first got me into this space, my journey into anti-hate activism. What brought me here to be speaking to all of you tonight? So this is me um, at about three years old. Um, I was born and raised in the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois, in the U.S., um, born to two immigrant parents who came to the U.S. Um, and, you know, as a kid, as, as I think this, this picture perfectly captures, you know, I, I was just a normal, confident, but, you know, quirky kid. I was a different kid. Um, I definitely had, you know, some personality about me. Um, and, you know, I was, as, you know, a lot of kids would put it at the time, I was different. Right? I was different. And unfortunately, as I got older and older and, you know, as we got devices, that difference was weaponized against me. People decided to take that difference and make it an issue. Um, so, so I knew firsthand as a young person um, what it could feel like to be excluded and what it could feel like to be told, because you're different, you're not enough for us. It was something I understood really, really well. But it was only when I was 13 years old um, that I learned for the first time the extent to which this issue of exclusion, and in particular cyberbullying, was an issue affecting youth, you know, around the world. It was when I was 13 that, you know, I came home from school one day and I happened to read online the story of a young woman, um, the first woman on the slide in the, the upper right hand, upper, upper left hand corner, um, you know, who, who had been cyberbullied for over a year and a half. And received, I mean, just some of the most awful messages I had ever seen. I hope you drink bleach and die. You are so ugly. And on and on and on. And I was horrified. I mean, I was horrified reading this young woman's story. Her name was Rebecca Sedwick. And I started to do more and more research. And, you know, sure enough, it turned out that she was not the only one who'd experienced the cyberbullying. There was Amanda Todd and Tyler Clementi, the other two young people you see on this slide, and so many others. And as a young person, I was so deeply frustrated that this had become our digital status quo, right? I, I was thinking, how is this okay? How have we come to accept this? And how can we do better than this? And so I decided, you know what, I can't be a bystander to this. I have to be an upstander. I have to think about a way to tackle this issue. And so, you know, at 13, I, I you know, with, with a little bit of confidence, decided to dig in. And the big question that was on my mind at the time, particularly being 13 years old, was, well, why is it that youth are so willing to be vicious from behind a screen? You know, as a young person, I didn't really buy, you know, the adult explanation at the time, which is, ah, kids these days, they're the worst. You know, I, I didn't really buy that. And I was thinking, well, why is it that young people are so willing to be vicious? What is going on there? I don't think that we're inherently worse. You know, what, what is actually happening here? And so I ended up doing a ton of research. You know, I was reading books, I was Googling, and all of this research led me, interestingly enough, to the teenage brain and the way that the brain develops. So you all may not know this. I didn't know this until I, I started this work. Um, believe it or not, when we're born, our brains actually develop from the back to the front. So the first parts of our brain to develop when we're born are back here. And then over time, slowly, 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 our brain develops all the way to the front. By the time you're 13, 90% of your brain is developed. There's only one part that remains, this front part, this last 10%. But what's really interesting is that last 10% itself takes another 13 years to develop. So you're only done when you're about 25, 26 years old. 
And I thought that's so interesting. Why would, you know, just 10% of the brain take so much time, the same amount of time as the other 90% to develop? And it turns out it's because this part of the brain controls decision-making and impulse control. This is the part of the brain that allows us to think in a critical, nuanced way about the decisions that we make in everyday life, that allows us to pause and calm down in the heat of the moment to make a smart decision. But in young people's brains, because their brain is not fully developed, this part of the brain does not work quite as well as it does for adults. In other words, the teenage brain is like a car with no brakes. And I thought, huh, that's really interesting. So you're telling me that young people have these brains that are not necessarily predisposed to think through the consequences of their actions, and we're giving them a device with immense power and access to the world that, you know, it makes it feel like everything that they're saying is ephemeral and just disappears into some digital space where it's even easier to hide behind the screen as opposed to look at someone's face. Could it possibly be that those things are creating a recipe for disaster? That in this digital environment, without those breaks, young people are not thinking. And they're saying things that they would never say to someone in person. And so that was when I had my aha moment. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to get them to think. I'm going to get them to rethink saying something mean. In the moment, I'm going to have them pause, review, and think. And that is how Rethink was born. The idea was really simple. I was going to develop a technology that, you know, when downloaded onto a device, could detect offensive content and then give you the chance to pause, review, and rethink. Whoa, are you sure you want to say something? Now, of course, as a young person, I was skeptical. You know, I had no idea if this, this was going to work. So I figured, you know what, let me go, let me go test the idea first. And so I ended up as part of a nine month study that was later celebrated by Google and MIT among other institutions, testing this idea um, with 300 youth and found that 93% of the time, teens aged 13 to 18 that got this chance to rethink changed their mind. So it was an incredibly effective, powerful, proactive way to stop cyber hate before the damage was done. And I remember seeing that and being shocked. And at the same time, not being shocked, thinking this makes a lot of sense. Young people are not inherently bad. We just need that moment to pause and rethink. We need that moment to be reminded of our humanity. We need a little bit more friction in our digital space. Since then, rethink has become so much more <laughs> than just the idea I thought of as a young person. Um, it has become, as I said, you know, at the top, a global movement to tackle online hate and build a better digital universe. Um, and, you know, as was referenced in the intro, I've been so blessed and humbled and grateful to be able to share, you know, about our work on the TED stage at the White House with Bill Nye, the science guy, who's one of my childhood heroes, um, you know, to, to even ABC's hit TV show, Shark Tank. And I think the big takeaway from all of this, particularly for the youth in the audience, what I hope, you know, if, if anything you take away from my story and everything I've been sharing is that there is immense power in young people like yourself, using your voices to be upstanders, not bystanders. You know, as young people, sometimes we look at ourselves and we think, well, what could I possibly do? You know, I'm just a teenager. You know, I'm just a young kid. What, what kind of change could I possibly, you know, contribute to our world? Well, I was just a normal kid, right? I was, I was this kid. You know, I didn't have a special lab coat or a genius IQ. I had passion to take on a challenge. Um, and that's what ultimately brought me into this work. And um, that's where I've stayed. I've been here for about a decade now. Um, so, so that's, you know, my message to the young people tonight. Um, if, is, you know, if there's anything that, that my, my story, my journey into the anti-hate activism space um, suggests, it's that all of us have a role to play in building a better internet and building a better world. Okay. So I've talked quite a bit about myself. <laughs> Let's go ahead and turn the focus back to all of you. So, you know, just to orient, we talked about cyberbullying. We talked about why it is that I'm so passionate about it. Now let's, let's make this a little bit more tangible and talk about what it is that you all should keep in mind um, as you, you navigate and experience digital challenges. So let's say that you're being harassed online or maybe a friend of yours is being harassed online or maybe you're a parent or teacher 
and you're wondering what to tell, you know, your, your children or your students, um, you know, if they are ever in this situation where they're thinking I'm being harassed online. Well, first thing that's helpful, you know, to, to convey is who they should go and talk to. And again, this is really key to confronting that 90% statistic, that statistic that 90% of victims do not report online hate. Um, you know, in conversation with youth, what we repeatedly find is young people often say, well, I didn't know who the right person was to talk to. I didn't know if it was my parents. I didn't know if they'd get mad at me. I didn't know if I should talk to my teacher. You know, when you when you clearly identify the young people, these are the people to go and talk to. Um, it, it's it's a lot easier for them, and you know they're they're much they're much more willing to go and do that. So the young people, I'd say, you know, as scary as it can seem, reaching out for help really is the best course of action. And you can talk to a parent, you can talk to a teacher, you can talk to a therapist, or any trusted adult, right? And the beauty of turning to someone is they have the resources to support you. They can help you get to a place where your digital experience is positive rather than negative. They can help you get away from hate and harassment that no one should have to experience. What are some resources um, that you can turn to, that you can seek help from? There are a number of resources. Um, Stopbullying.gov is a great resource um, that everyone can access. Um, it has everything from you know, important statistics to youth guides to teacher guides. So if you're looking for general information on cyberbullying, stopbullying.gov is great. Um, I'm also going to plug Ask Trish. This is actually a, a, uh, a digital blog that I run. It's at asktrish.org. And every week I anonymously solicit questions. So people can anonymously submit questions to me about the digital challenges that they're experiencing. So it's primarily youth. You don't have to share any identifying information with me. And you can just share information about this is the problem that I'm experiencing online. And kind of like any help blog or help column, I'm going to respond every week to you all with a blog post that includes a video and some expert vetted advice on how to take on your issue. So if you if you want, if you if for some reason feel like these are not options for you, which I understand in different contexts, they may or may not be. If you're not able to reach out to any one of these four individuals, you can reach out to me too. Um, often, um, you know, different countries will have national bullying, cyberbullying, or mental crisis helplines. Um, these are great to take advantage of. Um, there are also often resources that are specific for different youth communities, right? So as I referenced earlier, cyberbullying affects different youth communities in different ways, right? Um, so for LGBTQ plus youth, for instance, the Trevor Project um, has, you know, phenomenal resources um, and 24-7 guidance um, and counseling. Um, all for free. So something, you know, certainly for, for folks to access. And the last thing I really want to emphasize here is, um, you know, because uh, a lot of the cyberbullying is affecting minors, and I imagine a lot of the youth on the call today are minors, it's important to know that you can and should reach out to law enforcement if you feel threatened. Um, so as a minor, you have those protections. Um, so if someone is harassing you online, you can escalate it to law enforcement if need be. That may not be the right course of action, depending on the context, but let's say it's getting very threatening, it's getting violent, maybe someone is, you know, threatening you with sexualized content or illegal content. Um, law enforcement is absolutely an avenue for you. For adults, it's more difficult, but for minors, you know, you have quite a few protections. So that's just something to, um, something to keep in mind. Okay. So this is something that I, I often uh, I often have youth come up to me and ask me is, you know, Trish, I'm not the one who's being cyberbullied. It's my friend that's being cyberbullied. And how do I safely help my friend that's being cyberbullied? I, you know, I, I also get the question, what if it's my friends that are doing the cyberbullying? You know, I'm not participating, but I'm watching them doing it. And I, I don't like it and I don't know what to do about it. So let's start first with that question of how can I help a friend that's being cyberbullied? Um, I think the first thing that you can do is, you know, where appropriate, you can be an upstander, right, rather than a bystander, and you can speak up, right? Speak up on behalf of your friend. Rather than confront the cyberbully, try to educate, right? So instead of using you statements, use I statements. So instead of saying, you are awful, you are a bad person, you are saying bad things, don't say that. Say. I don't like how you're speaking. I want you to stop, right? So use I sentences rather than confrontational you sentences. Now, of course, keep in mind, right? If you ever fear for your safety, please turn to an adult. 
That is the number one way that you can help yourself and your friend. And your friend will thank you later, I promise. So, you know, don't ever, don't ever put yourself in a situation to, you know, to be an upstander if you think that it's dangerous. Another, you know, kind of way that, that you can, you know, help a friend out and you can actually, you know, kind of completely turn the situation on its head. And this is a more restorative perspective, which I think is also really important, is this idea of, you know, killing them with kindness. Um, you know, what's really interesting, which we see in the research and the literature is a lot of cyber bullies are former victims. They're young people who have experienced harassment themselves. And so they cyber bully to take out their own pain and their own insecurity on someone else, right? This is this principle that we often hear of hurt people, hurt people, right? So, you know, what's funny is I've spoken to so many young people around the world and now and then, you know, in countries all over, I'll hear from young people, they'll say, you know, Trish, I had this moment with, you know, a cyberbully where I just said, why are you doing this? You're better than this. And you're such a good person and everyone likes you. And, you know, I, I want you to be better than, and actually being kind and asking them, are you okay? Are you going through something? Ended up creating a breakthrough, particularly where the cyberbullying was not more severe and it was more snide remarks that were one-off. Having a conversation and offering some kindness um, was actually quite powerful uh, because it turned out that those people were just hurting too. So that's something to, to keep in mind as well. And then I would just say generally, you know, it's important to, to check in with your friends. Um, you know, sometimes we, we, we do this thing, right, where, where we, we talk with our friends, you know, as young people, and it's, you know, we ask, how are you? You say, I'm, I'm doing good. And it's just an automatic response. You're not actually telling someone how you feel, right? It's a very, you know, kind of cursory, you know, question, you know, how are you? And it's not, it's not, we're not actually asking how our friends are. You know, as young people, you have the most access, right, to your community by definition, right? And so, you know, check in with your friends, remind your friends how worthy and important they are, chat about your feelings, chat about, you know, the difficulties that you're facing, support one another. Um, you may be thinking, I'm the only one facing some difficulty. You probably aren't. And by leaning one another, leaning on one another, you can support each other. Okay, so we're on to the last section. And then um, I think I'm going to be on time and then we'll move to some Q&A. So start thinking of questions um, if you have any. I'm excited to answer them. But I want to end this section with some, some practical tips for you all on how you can live healthier digital lives. And here I want to offer some, some thoughts um, for, for general, you know, good digital practices. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be pulling from my, um, my book, Rethink the Internet. Uh, which came out in May of 2022. Um, this book was inspired by my many conversations with youth around the world who told me, you know, Trish, I think digital literacy and, you know, a safe internet's important, but the resources out there are just so boring, <laughs> you know, and I don't want to read anything that, you know, my parents or, you know, a teacher's giving me. And so what I did was I wrote a book for young people that um, I would have wanted to read as a young person um, that, you know, in a, a series of short stories teaches them how to be you know, responsible, intentional, inclusive digital citizens. Um, so this is a book that, you know, I, I wrote as a young person for young people. And I want to cover some of the key lessons that I talk about in here. So this is, you know, of course, going to come as no surprise to anyone on the call based on what I've talked about thus far. But one big piece of advice I want to I want to remind you all of and, you know, one good digital practice that, you know, can ensure that your privacy is protected and that your reputation and your digital footprint is protected is to always think before you type. It can sometimes feel in today's digital world like what we say doesn't matter. But what's really interesting, and a lot of young people don't realize this, is you always leave a digital footprint. Even if you delete content, there's still a digital record. There's no way to get rid of that digital record. And in today's world, often that digital record is you know, also being screenshotted, right? It's being circulated before you can delete. So always think before you type and post. Once you put your digital footprint out there, it's very hard to take back. So before you type, think, you know, am I sure I wanna post this? I think this last question is especially reflective and powerful. You know, would my family and friends be proud of what I've said? You know, I, you know would, would, would grandma feel good knowing that I'd written this? Right. If I was sending this to everyone in my family, would they be OK with this? Does this reflect my values and who I am? Always, always, always meditate on those questions 
before you type and know that what you're putting out into what can seem like this infinite ephemeral digital world is actually very concrete. And as we've explored thus far in the presentation has very real impacts. My second piece of advice um, centers around consent. Consent is a really core component of responsible digital citizenship. And it's something that we often you know, do not take seriously enough. I see it all the time, you know, young people taking pictures with someone or tagging someone or posting a picture of someone without asking. And it's not just young people. I see adults do it too, <laughs> right? Taking pictures of folks or tagging someone or posting, you know, something that involves someone else without asking for permission, right? Without asking for consent. So, you know, core component of responsible digital citizenship is asking before you take that picture, before you tag someone, before you post, right? You're a citizen of the internet. That's the best way to think about it. We're all citizens of this shared digital space. And that means we have to think about how our interests and what we want, you know, potentially, you know, you know, push up against what someone else wants, right? You have to think about how our actions can affect our fellow digital citizens, right? So, so always think before you and ask before you, you know, you know, take a pic of someone else or tag someone else or post, you know, a picture of someone else because that that key that key lesson of consent is really really core um, to to a good digital experience and being a good digital citizen. So this tip I think is is really really important. Maybe one of the most important um, you know digital literacy tips I'll leave you with today, um, and it relates to media literacy. You know nowadays you know on social media, which is where um, you know according to the most research, most recent research, a lot of young people are getting their news, and are getting current events. Right nowadays, you know social media is flooded right with articles, and it's really hard to know right whether what you're reading is something that is you know, high quality, whether it's something that's verifiable, whether it's something that you can trust. And so my big piece of advice from a, from a media literacy perspective for the young people on the call today and for everyone on the call today is, you know, to, to put your skeptical hat on when you're evaluating content that you see online, right? When you read something online, um, I always say, check these four things, check the source, right? Who is, who's writing this article? Check the date. Was this published five years ago? If so, it's probably out of date. It's probably not up to date, right? Check the author. You know, if you Google them, does something come up? Is this just a random person? Is this, you know, someone's uncle in a basement typing up an article? It might be. Nothing wrong with that per se, but it'd be helpful to know, I think, right, in evaluating an article. And check for bias, right? Is, is the language definitive in some way, right? The earth will, you know, come to an end tomorrow, February 13th, 2024. You know, that, that seems a little, that seems a little biased, right? <laughs> that seems a little, maybe a little too certain, right? So check for bias, check for, you know, any type of spin. And it doesn't necessarily mean that what you're reading is wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean that what you're reading isn't valuable, but it's just helpful to have that context, right? I always tell young people when you're evaluating information online, what you really need is context. Right? So you have a lens through which you can look at this information and make your own judgment calls and your own evaluations. Right? So you know, rather than give you tips on what and what not to read, that's impossible. What I've tried to do and what I think will be really helpful to everyone is you know, just, just how you go about evaluating this information. Right? Check the source, check the date, check the author, check for bias. Right. And in so doing, you can be a digital de detective, so to speak. Right. And you can position yourself to stay away from misleading content. Right. Or content that's more false than it's true. And remember, I mean, you know, this is the old adage, but you really can't trust everything you read online. And this is especially true today in the age of generated content. Right. More and more of the content that we see online is generated. That's everything from images to Amazon reviews to even articles. Um, there have been a ton of, you know, kind of, you know, revelations over the last couple of months of people realizing that articles that they were reading in some of their favorite publications were actually AI written, not written by human beings, but written by AI. Now, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but, you know, there's also been a lot of research that shows that, you know, AI in its current form still, you know, still very formative um, can be inaccurate, right? Can just be offering up answers very confidently that aren't necessarily right, right? So, Putting that skeptical hat on can be really, really helpful and valuable to you. Um, so, so definitely do that. 
Okay, right on time with the 40 minutes. I have to say I'm I'm very proud of myself normally. <laughs> normally I'll, I'll go over. Um, so that was today's talk on rethinking hate and digital literacy. I hope that that information and those tips were, were valuable to all of you. Um, and I think now we're going to move into some Q&A. Is that right, Carol? Yep. Uh, we actually have a good few questions. Okay. Uh, first, we'll start with someone I know is being cyberbullied. How can I help them? Yeah, certainly. Um, it's a it's a really important question. Um, so, I mean, I think, um, you know, to, to piggyback off some of the ideas in the in the presentation, but also to add to them a little bit, I think one of the best things you can do, um, certainly, um, is where you feel that it's safe, um, you can stand up for your friend. Um, again, if you don't feel like it's safe to do that, don't do it. Um, but if you feel like you can be an upstander in a responsible way, and do it in a way that is educational rather than confrontational, right? Using those I statements, um, that can be a really powerful thing. And, and there is power in numbers. If you don't feel like you can do that safely, I think turning to an adult is a really good way to help your friend. Um, your friend, you know, might say, don't do that. That's a betrayal. But, you know, what I hear constantly from young people that I speak to all over is, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, their friend was mad at first, but later their friend came around and said, thank you. Thank you for helping me out because I wasn't brave enough to do it, right? Um, and you can even brainstorm with your friend. That's another option, right? Talk about, come to consensus together, right? Talk about different options. And maybe they're not comfortable going to a parent. Talk about, hey, you know, could we go to this teacher that we both have together, right? Work with them and be, you know, a, you know, a, a point of, of support for them. Of course, in all of this, again, make sure to take care of yourself, right? This isn't a burden that you should also be carrying around. That's it's really difficult to deal with, right? When we see a friend being harassed in that way. So that's why I always say, if it ever feels like too much in any way, shape or form, turn to the adults in your life that genuinely want to help you. And I promise you, you're not going to be in trouble. Your friend's not going to be in trouble. Okay, thank you. The next question is, is the app free? Where can I find it? It is free. Um, so the app is free and it's available in the Google Play Store and the App Store. Um, more commonly used than our app today is our um, Chrome extension technology for schools, um, which if you're interested in, you can find out more about on our website, which is rethinkwords.com. Okay, great. For the next question, there's a good bit of these. The next question, how can I tell if my child is being cyberbullied? What can I do to help? Great question. Um, so. There are a lot of good um, warning, not good warning signs, but there are a lot of reliable warning signs um, that you can look for. Um, so one of the most common things that I, when I talk with parents um, whose children have been cyberbullied or parent survivors or even youth that I hear is um, my child looked visibly upset when they were on their phone or my child suddenly either was spending a ton of time on their phone or was just completely away from their phone in a way that was uncharacteristic. They loved spending time on their phone, but suddenly <laughs> they didn't want to be around their device. And that, you know, as, as a parent, especially if your child loves spending time on their device can, can kind of trigger um, alarm bells, right? The other things that we see, but this is consistent with a lot of different challenges, including in-person bullying, but we see young people who don't want to go to school, right? They're, they're missing school because they're sick, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we see young people who, um, are, um, you know, maybe experiencing some of those mental health challenges that I referenced, right? Um, you know, some sort of, you know, feelings of worthlessness, right? Maybe anxiety that you can notice um, that they're struggling with. Um, so I think that those are, you know, some of the, some of the things to, to look for. But, you know, one broader point that I'll make here is, you know, as a parent, if you're, if you're worried, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be on the in, right? With respect to, you know, my, my child's digital life and know if they're ever experiencing something like this. What I often tell parents is, Start as early as you can in having conversations with your children about um, their device use and about their digital experiences. So many young people I talk to say, the only time I have a conversation with my parent about my phone is when I'm in trouble. And that teaches young people, yeah. right? A certain type of yeah. lesson, right? About when to come to their parents <laughs> and what to tell their parents, right? About their digital experiences. So to the extent that you can have those conversations early, proactively, maybe even before your child gets a device or if they already have one, right, in a way that just makes it comfortable and natural for them to come to you. That's a really good way to ensure that, you know, that there isn't that lack of transparency. And if they are experiencing, you know, that cyber hate, there's a greater chance that they're going to come to you. It's just like uh, setting the foundation. So yep. they're open to coming to you with any issues they may have. Okay, okay. so the next two questions are sort of similar. So 
uh, you talked about the brain of young people, but have you found or searched why adults may bully as well? Because Yeah. young people can be can be bullied both online Yeah. and in person by the adults. So. Yes. Great question. Um, so yeah, so interestingly, um, what the research shows is yes, you know, our, our brains are developing and, you know, when we're adults, you know, all of our brain is developed, that helps, but that is offset by the habits that we develop as young people. <laughs> so if we spend our young adult life bullying, right, or cyberbullying, or treating people disrespectfully, it doesn't matter that at 25 or 26, our brain is fully developed. We're going to behave in a way that's consistent with the practices that we developed as young people, right? We are going to still be bullies or we're going to still be hateful. Um, so it just goes to show the importance, right, of intervening at that young age, right, in terms of developing the right practices and the right types of, of communication um, because those things carry forward in, in life. And you're certainly right that that adults bully you too. I mean, you know, what was really um, interesting for us at Rethink was, um, you know, during COVID when, when everything went virtual, um, one of our most requested product features in 2020 was, was actually companies asking for Rethink for, <laughs> for their employees because everything went virtual and suddenly everyone had gotten really snarky. right, in these digital environments. So clearly this is not just a child issue, right? Um, there's something about this digital environment that, that makes it easier, right, um, for us to say things that we wouldn't say in person. But two, you know, that bullying behavior that we see from adults, it's often a product of, of how they've been acting as youth, right? And that's why it's so critical that we address this at that youth age. Yep, and the the whole distance and uh, anonymity thing also really, Oh, yes. yeah, Spot yeah, on, for sure. yep. So for the next question, somebody wants to know where they can get the book. Uh, where can you get the book? You can get it anywhere books are sold. Um, so Amazon, um, you know, Barnes and Noble, all, all of those, all of those things. Um, you can get the book. Um, uh, um, it's it's available. <laughs> uh, it's also available as a as an ebook, and it's also available as an audiobook. If you just can't get enough of my voice after this one hour, you can hear me narrate <laughs> the whole book to you. <laughs> Okay, great. So for the next question, we, we still have a good bit more. In your opinion, what are some common misconceptions or misunderstandings adults have about teenagers' experiences with online bullying? Hmm, that's a great, that's such a phenomenal question. Thank you for that question, Brianna. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of different misconceptions that I've I've um, noticed over the years. I think one is um, sometimes, depending on the cultural context, adults might think of bullying as a rite of passage. That's something I've noticed, right? This is something that all youth go through. It's part of, you know, becoming, maybe becoming a man or becoming an adult, right? People, you know, have to be pushed that way. There's this sense of, you know, kind of, um, you know, suck it up. For lack of a better term, right? And you know that's that's something that I, that I've seen, and um, unfortunately, you know that perspective completely negates how harmful and how damaging this bullying can be, and the long-lasting effects it has. Um, some of the most you know impactful experiences I've had doing this work, you know, hasn't even been talking to young people; it's been talking to sixty and seventy-year-olds who cry, recounting to me the bullying that they experienced as children. It stays with them. right? Decades later, it stays with them. So I think that that perspective is, um, you, you know, while I understand it might be one that, you know, maybe you went through it. So you think, oh, your child has to go through it, or this is just how it is. And, you know, my child's being weak. Your child's not being weak. Your child is issuing a cry for help, um, you know, in, in uh, you know, in response to something that, that no child should have to go through, right? And so shifting our perspective, you know, with respect to that, I think is, is really, really key. Um, something else that I often see is, um, you know, kind of a common misconception is parents attribute um, cyberbullying to, you know, young people spending too much time on social media. And that's the reason that it happened. Um, there's a sense of wanting to blame the child, um, you know, and I understand part of that is a response to as, as a parent, you know, you're afraid for your child. And so you get mad, you know, but um, uh, the, the research shows that you could be on Instagram for less than a week. and already be, you know, receiving, you know, hateful content, you know, maybe, maybe even, um, you know, again, vulgar or sexualized content, right? So, you know, I think it's important not to conflate screen time, which is an important, equally important issue with harm, right? Even if your child is following every rule that you've set, um, you know, they may be experiencing that. So I think it's just really important to keep that in mind. And then I think finally, um, 
you know, I, I think it's important. One common misconception is, you know, we got that question earlier about, you know, how can I tell if my child's being cyberbullied? Sometimes the honest truth is, and this is scary, but there's this misconception that, you know, like bullying, because that's what people have in their heads, you know, you're going to see a bruised eye, right? Or you're going to see your child pushed to the ground. So you assume with cyberbullying, you're going to see something equivalent. Young people are really good at hiding this stuff. They're really yeah. good at right keeping that all. And so you, you're looking for something physically. Um, you don't see it, so you assume there's not a problem, but it's happening in here, right? Yeah. And we can't see what's happening in here, but what's happening in here matters just as much. And so this misconception of, well, they're smiling and they look fine. <laughs> so, you know, I, I assume there's nothing wrong. Um, you know, I, I think, and this is a, it's a broader lesson in, in this age of this mental health crisis that youth are experiencing is it's not enough to just look at your child and say, okay, well, you know, they've had dinner and they're smiling and it's good. Um, you know, having those conversations. And again, that's why I say having those proactive early conversations are really important because, you know, a lot of cyberbullying victims on the outside look fine, but on the inside, they're struggling and they're, right. they're just barely holding it together. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what advice do you have for parents, educators, policymakers, and policymakers in fostering a safer online environment for young people? Yeah, it's a phenomenal question. Um, so, I mean, I think for, for parents, I think I already gave my advice. You know, I won't sit on that soapbox for too long, but my biggest piece of advice is have those conversations with your child early about their device use, create open channels for communication. One practice that I've seen be really effective is um, having a regular weekly check-in with your child um, and your entire family about device use. And everyone sits down and talks about it, parents included. It creates you know, family accountability and it's a really good way to just create an open channel. For educators, I think to the extent that, you know, um, and, and you all are already doing the most, right? And so this isn't a, this isn't a, you know, a specific, you know, additional task for you all, but it's more a systemic question from an education perspective, right? How can we get more digital literacy education into classrooms? Um, you know, as a lot of youth today, you know, they're learning about all sorts of key topics, but, you know, we just kind of give them devices and go, go, you know, <laughs> figure it out, you know, but <laughs> yes. there's, a, there's, yeah. Yeah, there's a real question of, you know, is there is there, um, you know, is there a, possibly a way that we can set them up for more success that's more constructive? That's part of what we're trying to do with this collaboration with um, District 7030, of course, is, you know, providing, you know, free digital literacy curriculum because we want to create, you know, those those guardrails and that structure for young people to experience technology as opposed to just throwing them in the pool and, you know, asking them to figure out how to swim. And then for policymakers. I mean, I think we're seeing this push globally, but there's more of a push towards thinking about is there a policy role, right, for creating safe digital spaces? Um, yep. The internet has, you know, certainly in the U.S. been vastly unregulated for the last couple of decades, and we've seen that that's come, you know, come into come into conflict with a lot of really key public interests. And so, to policymakers, I'd say don't ignore this issue because <laughs> uh, clearly right. it's very relevant. Yep. All right. Next question: Is there a checklist? or guide or resource available maybe in your book that can help discern what is safe to post prior to posting, initial posting, not responses to others, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so the book does go through, you know, a couple of lessons actually that touch on that. And, um, you know, what we try and do is, you know, kind of provide a, a set of principles and yes, at times lists. Um, we also, you know, offer in the book little exercises after every chapter for young people to practice the skill that they've learned with their social media or their devices. Um, so you can you can kind of put those into practice. But, um, you know, I think in terms of, you know, what it is to post, we go into a lot of things like, for instance, whether again, you know, to that point of consent, right? You know, whether you should be posting about someone else, right? Um, to the, you know, the question of when you should be posting, right? Should it be in the heat of the moment, right? Versus, you know, possibly after you've taken a moment. I, I know a lot of adults, for instance, who will write an email and then sleep on it and then read it the next morning, right? <laughs> so we try and impart those types of skills to young people um, in the book. Okay, great. Someone wants to know, what if you find that you yourself have a habit of cyberbullying? How do you self-audit and how do you make amends? Hmm, it's a great question. Um, I mean, you know, I, 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 part of my work is I worked with uh, former victims. I've also worked with former cyber bullies, right, and talked to former cyber bullies. And, um, you know, I think, you know, if you are a cyber bully who is acknowledging that you have an issue, that is the most critical first step, um, you know, right? So you, you're acknowledging that you're having this issue. I think one of the best things that, you know, cyber bullies, former cyber bullies will tell me was, um, you know, having a picture of the type of person that they wanted to be 
in their heads mm -hmm. and aspiring to that better version of themselves and knowing that being kind to people was, you know, kind of the, the first step to getting there. And so part of that was making peace with the mistakes that they'd made. Part of it was, you know, to your point about making amends, a lot of people will apologize. Um, you know, some people in some cases, you know, it's not appropriate, but, um, you know, they're trying to put more positivity into the digital world. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't say any of this to condone, right, cyberbullying. That's certainly not my position here. But, right. um, you know, young people make mistakes, right? Um, and, uh, you know, where, where a young person is willing to step up and say, hey, you know, I, I've made a mistake, that in and of itself is a really powerful step. And then thinking a little bit about what's the image of the type of person you want to be, because you're clearly not feeling good about the type of person you are. What's the image of the type of person you want to be? And what does it look like for you to get from where you are to that person? Okay, great. So this one tackles uh, false profiles, fake profiles and stuff like that. They want to know, for the people who conduct bullying via those false profiles, how do you think this can be minimized? Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a really tough one. Um, and, you know, in the in the in the anti hate world, you know, that I'm that I'm very active in, we're always grappling with this, you know, we want to tackle cyberbullying, but at the same time, we want to protect people's, you know, right to be anonymous online and privacy, right? They're, they're really important rights that, again, kind of rub up, you know, kind of conflicting with each other. Um, in terms of how we can minimize it, I mean, gosh, it's it, there's not really a silver bullet solution here. There have been some policy solutions proposed, like, you know, requiring um, authentication. Those are very unlikely to, to get a lot of, tra you know, tra traction because of the way that they might, you know, exclude certain communities or prevent certain people from, you know, participating in digital activities. I think what, you know, you can more tangibly do if you're in a situation where, say, you're being cyberbullied by someone anonymous is um, actually turning to law enforcement. Because law enforcement, again, if you're a minor, can help you identify who that person is. Um, they can, you know, use modern technology and, you know, track down an IP address and figure out who whose computer it, <laughs> it belongs to. So if you're a minor, you have a lot more options available to you, and there is a way to um, to figure that out. But you know, kind of the, the broader, more you know, high level conversation about how to minimize this is fundamentally a question about how do we trade off safety with privacy? Um, right. And you know, there's no there's no perfect answer to that question. And to build off of that question, actually, uh, this person wants to know how can law enforcement be made aware that cyberbullying can be harmful and what tips do you have for doing that? Yeah, great question. Um, so, I mean, law enforcement, my guess is, um, you know, everywhere that I've traveled in the world are very aware. And the reason why is because they've seen a huge uptick in cyber crimes, <laughs> as you can imagine, in the last two decades. And so their, mm -hmm. their, their, you know, departments are now stuck dealing with all this additional crime that they didn't have to deal with 20 years ago. Right. So yeah. they're, they're, you know, trying to bring in new, new units. They're trying to help young victims. Um, but I do think, you know, there's certainly more room for education. And I think um, certainly a lot of young people don't know that they can go to law enforcement. They may feel afraid to do that. It can feel very extreme. And so I do think where you can create safe, um, you know, restorative community outreach between law enforcement and the community, um, that can be really powerful. Um, we've seen that, you know, in the UK where we supported an effort to, you know, have law enforcement visit schools, talk with youth, talk about their experiences, and just, you know, have, have youth know if ever you're in a situation where you're feeling like you're being physically threatened or sexually exploited, you can always come to us. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of helps youth identify them as, you know, a potential stakeholder that can support them in the most extreme circumstance. So I think that that's, um, that's something that, you know, when, when again, done in a way that engages the community and is safe and restorative can be really powerful. Okay, great. So last two, how can we help a teen bullied by adults trust other adults? Hmm. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, uh, it's a tough question, you know, um, and I think here we're getting into, you know, a really, really difficult trauma, right? That that probably is not is not going to be, um, you know, easily addressed or, you know, processed in, you know, a, a given. It, certainly, it's not. I I can't provide the answer to that question, right? In this in this, you know, quick time frame. Mm -hmm. But um, my my the thought that comes to mind is I think that that person probably, um, you know, needs to and certainly deserves to, um, you know, have some sort of counseling or therapy. Right. Because at that point, yep. it's a much deep rooted issue than cyberbullying itself. Right. Um, it's it's an issue of 
um, feeling like you have people that are in your corner that you can rely on. Um, and yep. when we feel like that most fundamental you know, need has been violated, um, like, like the, this person has very eloquently put it, we've got to build that trust back up. And that's not something that happens overnight. Um, so, so where I've seen, you know, young people that struggle with that often therapy or counseling is the answer and it can be really powerful. Okay. So last question that I think we have time for, uh, what advice do you have for individuals who might be too scared to step in for their friends who are being cyberbullied or who are too scared to step up to their own bullies? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, if you're too, too scared to step up, it's maybe for good reason, right? In which case, again, maybe it's time to turn to an adult. Right. If you're feeling that scared, um, what does yep. it say about the character of the of the cyberbullying that's going on? Right. And possibly maybe it's time to involve an adult. The other thing you can do, of course, is support your friend. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't you don't want to talk to the cyberbully. That's fine. You can sit with your friend at lunch. Right. Right. You can you can you know, you can walk with your friend, you know, to, to classes. You can you can provide that support by being there for them. Right. But, you know, my, my broader point here is if you're at a place where you feel like you're too afraid to say something, um, that may mean that the cyberbullying has gotten to a point where it really shouldn't be your responsibility to take it on. It's, it's better to involve an adult to figure out how to tackle that. All right. Thank you. Well, Trisha, thank you so much. This was really excellent. Um, I think we've all come away with incredible insights into how we can make our time online healthier and safer for everyone else. And I couldn't think of anyone more suited to deliver that message than you. And for that, we are extremely grateful, uh, my, my club and I assume everybody here. And we thank you. Um, I believe there was something here for everyone to leave with and I encourage our participants to share what, we, what we've learned here tonight with anyone they think might be struggling with this or even anyone who they think this information could be useful to uh, who might not be in attendance here tonight. Uh, please feel free to reach out or check out the website. And lastly, I'd like to thank the participants uh, for coming out tonight and sharing in this experience with us. I know it's a little bit late and we all have busy schedules, but on behalf of all of us at the Rotorac Club of Kingstown and the wider District 7030, we sincerely thank you for coming out. Thank you so much, everyone. It was wonderful to be with you for the hour. And Thanks again, Trisha. Yeah. Interest in the issue. Thank you. Thank you.